Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are, or good evening, and welcome to another Eye on Africa. My name is Awasa. I'm Assistant Director for Academic Affairs at the African Studies Center at Michigan State University, and Eye on Africa is our weekly seminary series, and we hope you all had a wonderful break. We're happy to have you again. And we're very delighted today to have Eganga Jones Jolly as our speaker. And before I pass the floor to him, a brief introduction. Eganga Jones Jolly is a Spanish writer from Madrid. He was born in Spain, and their parents came originally from Equatorial Guinea, particularly from Noe and Creole culture. Heraderas La Chera was his first novel published in 2015. The plot of this novel is the memories of the main character named the Eganga struggling to find a better future in Spain, surrounded by misfortune, ra racism, love, and familiar bounds are the main ingredient of this story. His second novel, El Diario de Marc, was published in 2018. This novel tackles the biracial relationships between Mark and his wife, Mara, in Equatorial Guinea. Geopolitico del Conflicto de Guinea Equatorial is his last work. This book analyzes the conflict among the ethnic group in Equatorial Guinea. It was published in 2020 in FD1. So thank you so very much for being here. Uh, I pass the floor to you now, Agenda. Thanks to everyone. I'm really glad to be here. Um, it's not my first time. I'm, I'm related. Um, I was in uh, MSU um, in October. I never been there before, and I, I could see uh, like such a great university with great people, great professionals. I learned a lot from them, so I'm really grateful to to be here again. So. All the things I would like to say before to start is like, my English is not really good, it's not perfect. So sometimes I could get stuck uh, during my presentation. So uh, I will need probably some help time to time, but no worries, I think uh, it will be fine. Uh, and then yes, after, after the introduction of uh, Awa, I would like to say like, um, I, I start as a writer in 2015, more or less. That means more than six years, I published my first novel and then came the second one and the third one. So I'm gonna try to introduce my last book, um, Geopolitica del Conflicto de Guinea Equatorial. In English is Geopolitics and Conflict in Guinea Equatorial. Uh, that for me is a, very specific book because um, I, I've studied politics um, uh, by the university UNED. It's like a distance university, online university. So I never been in a kind of environment where you are surrounded by thinkful people uh, and things like this. So the five years I was studying politics, it was to be like a monk. Uh, just reading and writing. Then for me, um, at the end of this, uh, the five years, I should do like a kind of thesis. This is, uh, my thesis is this one, is Geopolitics and Conflict in Guinea Equatorial. And it was published by um, Editorial D1 in Spain. So uh, Editorial D1 supports me a lot and gave me a, a lot of um, help to try to achieve this. So I would like to say thanks to all the people in the one. Um, and that's it. So the day I, I, I'm not academic writer. I'm, I write more about fiction. Um, and then my knowledge is a kind of limited. So I would like to point this because for me, trying to introduce myself in the area of politics and conflict, it was a challenge. Um, yeah, most of my research about uh, 
Equatorial Guinea and Africa, it comes from my personal experience. I've been living in, in, in Guinea. The first time I went to Guinea, I was 24. Uh, I was seven months living with my family. I never met my family before. Uh, so for me, it was like a really um, deep impact in my life. Go to Guinea. I was born, I was ra I raised in Spain for my whole life and I've never been in another country even. So uh, with 24, I was, I went to, I traveled to Guinea. I was there for seven months living with my grandma, with my cousins and every, um, my family in general. And then I came back in 2012. And then I was working in a petrol company, American petrol company. It calls uh, Amco, and then they produce um, they produce methanol. So, yeah, most of my experience came from that that period. So I'd like to start with um, everybody is, is can can uh, can watch the screen with the the presentation. No problems for with this. Yes, yeah, so far so good. We're seeing it. Okay. Okay, perfect. So let's go. The world has never this has never been discovered, has been simplified. This is something like I write in the it's the first sentence of my book, and then it's like trying to introduce all my 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 ideas about why I'm trying to um, explain about Equatorial Guinea. Equatorial Guinea is a country, but this country was created in, in fact because of kind of interest. The reality of Equatorial Guinea is more complex than that. So it's not just a line of borders, it's something else, yeah? And then I would like to, so what is for me this kind of simplification and then this kind of complicity of the reality in Equatorial Guinea, that that reality could be even um, related to the whole continent in Africa because Equatorial Guinea has the same as situations that other countries in, uh, in Africa. So I would like to introduce first what, um, Equatorial Guinea, what is the, the country itself. We have the continent, the main uh, area is the continent. In this, in, in this area, there are two main ethnic groups. One is in this here, littoral, you can read here. Littoral means more or less uh, kind of the coast in here. So in this area in the West, we're based here, uh, I don't know exactly when, I don't have the, the um, exactly moment where they came, but probably uh, before other groups in here, like Fang, they were settling here before than them. So here in this area in Little we have uh, in the West Ambicio, and then in this other area, we have uh, farm people. Farm and constitute like 70% of the people in Equatorial Guinea. And then most of them are where located here. Like now they are in any part of the country, mainly here and here in Bioko. We have Bioko, like in Bioko, mostly um, the original people from here are Bubi, uh, this other ethnic group. And then most of the economy of um, Equatorial Guinea is based in here right now. All the petrol industry is based in here. And then we have also Anobon. Anobon came from the Portuguese. That means Anobon means uh, New Year, came from the uh, Portuguese language. And here, most of them are um, the standard from slaves. And then they create a new language from it comes like um uh derivates from the Portuguese, like um to say like Creole or something. So most most this is Equatorial Guinea, uh, more or less. Yeah. So let's see something else. This uh is some data about Equatorial Guinea. It's very difficult to find that about Equatorial Guinea, like poverty and things like this. So uh, most of the data is not really updated. Um, that I would like just to share, even if it's not really updated, I would like to share like a kind of figures in here. Like Equatorial Guinea is the third 
producer of petrol and gas in Guinea behind um, Nigeria and Angola, I think. And then because we can read here, Guatemala Guinea produce uh, 244,000 barrels per day of oil as 2016, ranking 34 in the world. Equatorial Guinea produce every year an amount of a kilogram of 8.1 of its total proven reserves. Equatorial Guinea exports 17% of its oil production, mainly to United States. Here we have uh, figures about the GDP. We can see here how this dramatically increase is uh, due to the petrol and uh, oil gas industry, and then drops again. Right now we are probably in recession in here, probably, yeah. So you have more data in here if someone was curious to see what is, what is the more data about the country Guinea oil and petrol industry. I tried to get some data about figures about population and poverty, but this is really, really difficult. I contact with um, um, Mokate, that is the director of Diario Rombe. Diario Rombe is uh, one of the main leads. Um, how, how could you say? Um, they, they do a great work to try to um, publish all these kind of uh, corruption things about the Quattro Guinea of those persons that I try and try to get money from the government or stole money in, in a better way. So, I, but they couldn't find anything and then even they couldn't give me a, proper data, accurate data, because it's, it's really difficult to find out about Equatorial Guinea. But I, I could say like Equatorial Guinea is no more than 1 million persons. And then most of that persons lives in the poverty right now. So to start my working uh, about the geopolitics, one of the things like it's, it's quite important to um, um, just to define itself, is what is a conflict. So, uh, Johan Gautun, he's a professor, he's a writer, uh, really well known in this kind of thing. So, uh, I took his, uh, his work as a reference to discover if uh, Equatorial Guinea has a conflict or not. The hypothesis about is trying to see if there is something um, discover the reality of you know, of uh, of Equatorial Guinea, because the uh, government said like there is like kind of peace around the country. There is no conflicts between uh, ethnic groups like in other countries. Like uh, could could say could could be in uh, in the past in, in Rwanda or in many other countries, you know. And then the president of the Equatorial Guinea say like. If there is no conflict in Equatorial Guinea because of this. There is no like kind of war or riots by, with violence. There, there is no kind of that. So you, if you go to Equatorial Guinea, you could you you might say, okay, this is not the, really something like dramatic in here. Like you can presume like something is wrong or people is really upset with the government, but maybe it's hiding, you know. So that's the thing we are trying to define: what is conflict and analyze what is a conflict taking the sample of Equatorial Guinea and his, uh, and his uh, reality, and its reality. So we have here some background about Johan Gautun. And then one of the things that Johan Gautun gave us as a uh, item to start to do this, analyze this concept, is this three contexts. It's like behavior, suspicion, and contradiction. So Galton say is um, the, only, the, the only thing we can try to start to analyze a conflict is um, looking for a system with a kind of goal for human beings. So we must try to see the system and see the system is that goals itself is, uh, is going for that purpose or if it's not, it's designed for that purpose or if it's not, it's completely different. So. The behavior, it could be the, the way the people act. The suspicion is this, this kind of um, things that are hiding, that are the real, the real attitude of the people. And the contradiction is the goal itself that is not, is not the really 
is not really uh, possible. So, uh, so with Johan Gautun, I start to think what to start to analyze as a variable independent. So the state for me, the colonial state is one of those variables. We, 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 I would take the colonial, colonial state from one hand, and then I would take race in the other hand. I'm trying to see how those, those, those two are operating between them and see what is the correlation, uh, what it means or, or how it could, could change in some point, you know? So um, then, After take this two a state I'm raised, there are all the things I create in order to analyze the situation of the equatorial game. So if you can see in here, this, um, this uh, drawing, this, this, this circle, there are two things like get my attention when I was trying to explain this. So in, in one hand, we have this totalized power, it comes from the colonial state. On the other hand, we have the informal power based on the traditions and knowledge of the people of the patriarchal Guinea. These two have kind of, of not fighting each other, but there is a competition maybe. And this central space in here is the power, is the, is the, is the space like a chill. I, get, I got this from a chill and then like we call we call we can call them commandment. The commandment is a is a concept that comes from the the book from a, a chill member called uh, post colony, and then the commandment is something like um, trying to define this colonial state where there is no right, there is no law for the for the people from the for the Equatorial Guinea, the locals for the locals, and then there, it's not that liberal state. So it's something based in um, violence. And then there, where there is not law itself, it's, 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 completely, it's completely abolished. It's not law at all. So it's violence and force. So this space in here, uh, I could say this is, could be the, the colonial state. And then it could be state with this institutionalized power based in military and violence. And then this other power that is marginalized, I could say, I, we might say that this could be the traditions and the knowledge of the people from uh, the locals from the cultural again. So this central uh, area represents the, um, the power of the colonial, of the colonial state, the, the real power. I mean, the combination of these two in here and then in there, we can see the commandment of a chill member he describes in post colony. Nothing really interesting about Johan Galton and uh, chill member. They describe they describe in the conflict. Johan Galton described like there are um, two or three kinds of violence. There is a direct violence, like this the violence uh, to your body itself. There is a cultural violence that someone would, would take your, uh, probably your, uh, may force you to talk a different language or to any a different way or prohibit some kind of um, uh, traditions, religions. And there's other one that is, um, hmm. it's true to that. Like it means like that balance that is like uh, the police or the military or yeah, that is structural, direct and cultural. Then Achille and Bembe give us all the three that uh, give us the, the, the idea how the colonial state is funding. We can read it here. On the other hand, colonial sovereignty rested on the three sorts of violence. The first was the founding violence. This is what they underpinned not only the right of conquest, 
but all the prerogatives flowing from that right. That is play an instituting role in at least two ways. First is help it to create a space over which it was exercised. One might say, one might say that it proposed its own existence. Second, it regards itself as the soul of power to use its clouds. When it's one sideness, especially as to adopt Hegel's formulation. Its presumed right, right was, but its capacity to assume the art of destroying. Simultaneously, the supreme denial, denial, denial of right. That's that's the thing about, I think this is the main characteristic of the colonial state. It's not no right at all. So this, this is the contradiction that we're talking about in the definition of the system of the colonial state. There is no right at all. So if there is no right, what is the reason to follow the rules? This is, this is other um, um, definition of Pachillo Mbembe that is quite interesting. On the, on the hand, it combined witness and inflation of the notion of right, witness of right in that, in the relation of power and authority, the colonial model was in the both theory and practice, the exact opposite of the liberal model on the debate of discussion, inflation of right in that set, in that set when deployed in the form of arbitrariness and the right of conquest. The very concept of right often stood rebelled as void. So it's more or less the same, yeah? So we're talking about the colonial state like something is based on violence and um, force. It's not law at all. So what's the reason the locals trying to introduce in this, in this, in this kind of system? There is no reason. So locals were forced to be, to be there. So this is a uh, this is in Spanish. I'm so sorry because uh, I couldn't uh, translate it this and then make it clear in English. But I'm gonna try to explain this. So after get the the um, the point of what it is a conflict and then trying to figure it out what is the analysis taking the state and the race as main variables and then trying to draw these in a complex uh, area where the relationship works in a system, like a colonial system, I tend to see the process of this change. Why the people introduce inside the colonial state? How was the way to introduce those people, not just with violence, you know, always also with the kind of these ideas we're in introducing the colonial states to nowadays to, to accept it. So in my point of view, it was a kind of, way to change the meanings of the locals. I mean, the, the world that it was So this world, like it could say, we might say this is like the proper world of the locals, like it comes with uh, traditions, religions, languages, and everything. At the way they try to interact with these ones, with this, with that one, that's the colonial state that the, the, the institutionalized power based on violence, they change, they change the reality of this ones. It was affected, yeah. So the process of this give us as result. Like for example, I could take this work in here. This work came from Indue people. My parents are from Indue group um, in Quattro Guinea. That word means um, literally, not literally, I think there is not a Southly um, translation for this. But after Spanish stay in Equatorial Guinea, the tradition, the, the direct tradition to Spanish means play. Jugar in Spanish is means play, playing, jugar, you know. So this word in um, Indue language means at the same time, if you, you want to translate it, it means jugar, playing, and then at the same time, it means dancing, dancing and playing. So one of the things I learned from, if you look at in the past, playing, it's not something like a kind of meaningless in uh, in Africa. 
playing at some point, if we are looking at, if you, if, if we see like dancing is traditions. So playing and dancing were the traditions, like after the contact with the um, Spanish was translated as playing. So my idea in this, in this drawing is like the traditions, the religions and the history were packed in one place and were itself contained in the kind of things like we, we might say mayoka. Yeah, the mayoka means all of that. All of that in, I could, I could say all of that is the power itself of these communities, the way they, the, the knowledge, the way they believe in something, um, the way they, all, everything was contained in here. But after the contact with the Europeans, all these things were segregated and then at the same, at the same time, they lose the meaning. The, 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 the original meaning. So why? In my point of view, with the Hegelian Hegel perspective, the modernity and all the things change the values of the, of the locals. And then at the end, the cultural ideas and the knowledge um, became like something meaningless. So we are in here, Equatorial Guinea again, yeah? So uh, Equatorial Guinea, the reality that the, the reality of Equatorial Guinea, when it started, the um, Portugal and Spain, they have different interests in the area. So, El Tratado de Tordesillas, I think it's the, tra the Tratado de Tordesillas. Um, I don't know how to translate this, but the Tratado de Tordesillas um, between um, Spain and Portugal allows to um, Portugal to conquest the, in Latin America, that, that area like it's called right now Brazil. They were interested to get more uh, space in that area. And then, for other hand, the Spanish, they get access to the Atlantic area, to the Gulf of Guinea in, in Africa, because they were interested to rape people to, in order to slave, um, slave the, 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 to get slaves. So that's the other thing. And then there was the Tratado del Pardo. Then Spain get some, um, some advantage to colonize the area um, in the Gulf, of, the Gulf of the Guinea, the Gulf of Guinea. So Guinea started as a reality because of slavery, because of slaves. Uh, the, the Spanish were interested to get the slaves from that area. So at the moment Guinea was created, we have these two areas where the power with the Sahara is settled in this this power, this central power in here, the co-co management, based on the military and then religious, Catholic and religious. Most of these, um, and in the beginning, most of the groups in here, they, they weren't really peaceful with the idea to get in into the um, the colonial state, like um, and, and it, 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 the create the create these relationships. But uh, they have a different approach to the um, to the colonial states. In the way people, they were more. Um, it looks like I could say like I can 100%. They were more related to the Europeans at that time. They they have some kind of deals, uh, commerce with uh, Spanish, English, even Portuguese, because they have this access to the um, littoral, yeah, to, to the coast area. But fund were really um, deep. They were they were in here, so for them was more difficult to access to the to the to the sea and have this context. And then here, uh, Bioko, uh, Bioko has um, 
particular um, history because um, for English was uh, a point where they were um, controlling the slave uh, trade. And then we have a lot of mixture of people from the, probably from Biafra, people who came from Sierra Leone. So here it was a lot of mix of people and interest too. And then this work, the other one was a little bit insulated to be honest. But the, one of the things about Equatorial Guinea, the power was more concentrating here. And then I could say all in the second point of of this institutionalized power or um, commandment itself, like um, military and economic were in here also in Bata. So Bioko and Bata were the two centers of that power. So here, boobies were in here, settling here, and fan in this area. Uh, in the West, ambitious in this other area. So how we started this, this um, I could say this, um, how these local groups were affected in the way the colonial state was settled. Um, first, they, they had the limitations because of, of the borders, yeah? In the way people were not just in here, in the way we're here and here also in Gabon and Cameroon. Uh, Fan too, Fan were in Cameroon and also in Gabon. They, they were the most, the biggest group in, in, in Quattro again, 17%, yeah? So there were some limitations at the time to move around to one, one an area to another, yeah? The, the other thing is when the, um, they settled, when they, the, the European settled here, in this case, the Spanish, they came with um, this uh, military state, military um, system. And then, but they came also with, with uh, some interest about economic um, and some kind of approach to economic, uh, to try to exploit the area, you know? And in this case, uh, Malabo, um, Bioko becomes, becomes one of the areas more, more richest and more rich in, in, in Guinea because they exploit um, cacao. And then here we have uh, the forest and maybe I think coffee, coffee, maybe they exploit coffee, I think, yeah, also. But the richest area was in here. So what's the thing? They need workers to exploit the cacao, but the boobies, they, they, they wanted to, to work from the, for the, for the foreigners, for the for Europeans, so it was some kind of battles, wars between boobies and Spanish. So they bring the, the Spanish uh, bring uh, brought some people from Cuba and Nigeria to exploit the cacao in here, but also they brought people from here, from the farm people. They were the seventy percent. They brought some some people from the from this this this, this part of the country. So the, this kind of movement of these groups, they were um, limited by their own activities. And then they were forced to work in this economy of the colonial state, yeah? So this interest start to force these people to, to, to behave in a different way, just to order to survive. Because uh, one of the things about the colonial state is like that, is was present in any any moment of your life. So this um, relationship with that changed the behavior of the people in the equator again of the locals. So they were forced to to be um, in this system, and then at the same time, this uh, central power in here was. Uh, occupied by the, the 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 Spanish, but not just the Spanish, because there were other guys, other other people that they have influence in here. That could be probably uh, people related to the um, of of Equatorial of Guinea. So more more or less Europeans, yeah. So what's going on at the time? The I could say like independence came. So 
it creates a competition between all these groups. These groups never work together. These groups were united because the, the colonial state exists as a, as a reality or something like it was forced for Europeans to assist. So at the time, these groups were trying to be more familiarized with the colonial state. Uh, they, they were more, they, they look for the opportunities inside the colonial state. They came from here, this area to here, but the, 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 the real point was trying to access in here and this central area. So when the, um, when the, um, the independence started to, to be like something uh, more just uh, like, like a reality and then Spain um, must do a process to um, uh, people from Equatorial Guinea could have the, delivered themselves his own future um, destiny. Um, these groups organized themselves um, in, in the, um, based on the, his um, own ethnic group. So uh, we have some political parties that appears, most of them uh, based on the original, um, so the ethnic group, the cultural group, but uh, there are other groups, there are other uh, particular political um, groups like have uh, people from Fang, Ambo, Rio, in the way, but it, it was a kind of, they, they, they didn't work together. Mm, all these groups, all these cultural groups, they, work, they didn't work together, really. They have a fear, and the fear came from the, from Fang because they were the majority. So the idea they found could be the next group to control or the other ones makes every, everybody feels like they don't trust each other too much. So this um, feeling of no, don't, don't trust each other were based on the system of the colonial, colonial state. It's not something like it can because of, you can really, I, I would say like, like the way it was it were designed makes these groups uh, don't trust it, uh, between them. So the competition was was based on, on, on to, to occupy the, the central power of the colonial state. So after the influence of the of the um, Europeans and Spanish, I could say like uh, the behavior of the people of Equatorial Guinea was based in these these three characteristics. I could say like uh, the race, black and white, and the ethnic group. So the idea is the result of this is the way you pretend or to, you're trying to add if you are black and then plus your ethnic group and then the way you are related with the occidental cultural power, that means there is a result. I mean, if you are an African right now in Guinea, and then the way you add is too African in some way. Uh, that means like probably you, you are not really accepted. So it's a contradiction, but this is, is, is like this. So most of the groups don't trust each other because they're Africans. And then this, uh, this idea, it was, was introduced by the colonial state with the education, with the religion, and many other things. This is this is a really deep um, analysis. I, I just trying to to point some ideas in passing this um, this presentation. But uh, the way the colonized state was designed itself is trying to make not not confident to the people, just trying to don't trust each other, and then don't trust between Africans and Black people. So the idea to, um, to be more, um, I could say, to be more acceptable is to approach to white. The idea, to, what it means to be white, because at the end, white is not like just the, the person with a, a phenotypic or something like that. It's white in the colonial state means power, means knowledge, 
a meant um, kind of justice. So the narrative of the white and black in Kocho was the opposite. So the idea to occupy this place means in some point trying to look, trying to look white. So uh, I hope you could approach to most of my ideas in this book. To be honest, it's, um, it's a deep um, and difficult and complex uh, analyze. Um, I could explain most of them in, um, in this presentation. I just give some ideas in order to have a good conversation. But if you are really interested and then if you, lo if you know how to read in Spanish, this is the book in here. So I hope you are enjoying my presentation. Um, and thanks so much. Thank you very much, Janga. So if you have questions, you can either raise your hand or you can write it in the Q&A questions. Uh, we, we are very delighted to have you here. And one of the reason is we really don't hear a lot about Equatorial Guinea. Uh, since I oh, have yeah. been here, I think this is my first uh, lecture about Equatorial Guinea. So I don't know about the audience, but I would appreciate a little bit more information. For instance, I heard you talking about I understand the idea of people trying to, to, to become white because that's where the power is. But I was wondering, what's the percentage of white people still living in Equatorial Guinea, if, if, if it's an important population or not? I'm, I'm not sure. I think, uh, yeah, um, now, right now, one of the, one of the, one of the parts of the books I, I didn't, I didn't, um mention is like uh cultural guinea is not just about white and black right now we have chinese we have um people from uh middle east we have people uh, and then now people from united states the main influence right now is united states and china then um the idea to be white or black in Equatorial Guinea is, is, is based in this characteristic about, um, how could I say, um, after interact with the colonial state, the colonial power, they put the, the, they put the idea, they create the idea, like black people is not mm, capable itself to do things yeah they create this idea and they put it like um um in in, in this system to make uh feel like uh black people they need white people in order to survive in order to create better things in order to um, the, the idea of modernity um is something like for in the way they they were treat in the way they were teach thought um, is like um, they, they are not capable to do it. They need the, the, the white people in, in, in some way, but it's not just the white people as the person, it's the white people as idea. So that's, mm -hmm. that's the complex thing about this. That means to be white means many things related to the way you behave and the way you act and the way you even you talk. For example, for me, when I go to Equatorial Guinea, for most of the people, they call me white. So that's that's the interesting thing. So, but the influence of 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 white right now is based on the Chinese and United States. Thank you. There is one question. Thanks very much for the pre for the presentation and it was very eye opening and informative. I would like to find out if there are any efforts to decolonize people in the country. That's from Lula Justice. Decolonize people. Um, 
I think um, the most difficult thing is this 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 point uh, about this question. So decolonize, because what it means decolonize, because we are right now talking in Spanish, we are talking in English, and then you have religions like Christians are. So there is a real point about the in, in Equatorial Guinea, there should be a debate about what it means, why, what is the reason we are together right now? Because uh, we were forced to be together and then now we should try to, to, to find a sense of to be together in a way it could be useful for everyone. Because um, in this moment, there are some groups like Indo West or Arnabon or people from Bubi people, they say, okay, I don't need to be together to this other people. We can have my own country with uh, Bubi or Indo West separate. So we need to find a really um, idea to encourage encourage us as a, as a group, not, not just as a group, also a pe people to live together to challenge the reality. So decolonize um, maybe means that though trying to fight idea like um, no, we are not contaminated because of this racism. Um, we could find real bonds to to live together, to build together, and things like this. So the find to the way to find it, to be honest, I don't know. I think we should we should try to start to recognize ourselves, um, not just as an ethnic group, uh, as an Africans in a way we were treated under all Charles the same, and trying to um, find. Um, something like um, no, not in the in the Occidental knowledge. Something like was in the African knowledge. That's that's my idea. Thank you. Any other question or comment from the audience? I have another co uh, uh, question for you. Uh, are there conflict going on right now between the different ethnic groups? Yeah, I think so. I think so. There is a conflict, but this conflict is not really because the, the, the difference between the conflicts in other parts of Africa and in Guinea is not, is not a kind of conflict like we have. You have a war between the different groups, but there is a kind of uh, the, these groups don't trust each other. So, fund don't trust in the um, with um, Indo West or Fan or so there is a way that the things are are working like they don't they don't believe themselves it, you are different from a different group so um, and then there are uh, political parties they were created most of them are also Guinea they are trying to um, promote the idea to separate from one, one group to another and live in a different, create a different country um, just for those, uh, for those groups. So we have a question from Yomera. You visited MSU in the fall. What did you think about the study of Africa and black studies here versus Spain or Guinea Equatorial? Guinea is just great. So I never been in a as, as I said before, I never been in a great such a great uh, university as that one. And then I could meet with the different people from many other countries, and most of them really really engaged with the idea of uh, trying to find uh, uh, a solution for the day 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 by day or. Or solutions like that are not really far from us. So um, trying to help each other and trying to see what are the things like make us 
happier and stronger um, as a black community. So this is something like I couldn't see in many in, in other places, at least in Spain, you don't have this kind of environment. Probably you have people like is working in that in that direction, but uh, I never seen um, an environment where you can see people with uh, have such a high profile like Jomaira and others. Um, so yeah, it was was great for me. It was great. Wonderful. Another question is: What is the major local language or languages? and what effort is put in place to encourage or promote local languages? I think the local languages have the keys for everything because as I saw in the, in the presentation, the translation of many of these words is completely wrong. So the reality of Africans are in the languages. We should look for in the languages to see how we, um, were related before as the colonial state, and then avoid the colonial state needs a different kind of knowledge. The idea is we are kind of um, mm, how you say like a colonial knowledge is, is 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 in our brains, and then we cannot go outside and see a different knowledge. So we we must try to find this. African knowledge that is going to give us a different point of view, and maybe that point of view is a um, is a point to start to build something different. Thank you, uh, Amadou. You you can you can talk. You can unmute yourself and speak. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, uh, my question is uh, a little bit related to uh, the different ethnic group that they they have in uh, uh, and uh, how is it possible? Because I'm Garba, I'm from Niger, West Africa. I'm studying at uh, MSU also for the Humphrey program. Uh, I just want to ask him a particular question of uh, relative to my country. In Niger, we are around 10 ethnic groups, but the chance that we get, we have a kind of mental parts cultural for, 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 for our uh, population. Like the 10 ethnic group, they come together to put a cultural value, like a cousinship joking, like the different ethnic group can joke with each other at the extent that uh, and believe that which is unbelievable. Sometimes it may even uh, turn in fight, but it will never be the case. Is it possible for a junior to have this kind of uh, value that they can cultivate uh, to allow them to be in peace and uh, not fighting against uh, the different ethnic group? Be honest, I don't know. Um... The, the way the Guinea was was colonized is different from other countries. I think the main characteristic of Guinea is the um, they create Spanish they create um, a system where religion was really really important, and the main approach to, 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 to the people was the religion and then also the violence of military this military power, and um, yeah, so religion demonized the Africans demonize the traditions, demonize everything like it means to be African. So at the time, the Africans could have a relation between them. Uh, I think they, they don't feel really comfortable because they don't trust in the Africans. So one of the things that happened is in Equatorial in Guinea, one of the groups they don't have too much contact with the Europeans were farm people. And then fun are the majority, and at the same time, um, they have these. Um, they were, in some way, less affected by the this is colonized uh, um, period. I mean, like uh, they don't they don't really lost a lot of traditions and things um, from um, from them, but in the way 
booby uh, they were they were more affected um i think the relationships between them is because of this lack of knowledge and this this um this way uh, the idea of african was settled as something negative then um at the same time that the, the, the contradiction is everybody would like to approach to be white in some way white as a as an idea of power of knowledge of of behavior so there is a clear contradiction because if you're trying to be white in order to become white if you don't like african like like, like they are of africa that means african in this in this in this in this situation i think it's like they are not fighting each other really they are fighting between in, inside them i mean it's, it's like something they have inside and they don't they don't know how to respond i know if 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 i respond to your question uh, i think uh it, it's it's quite good because that means is a kind of a cultural uh clash that the, uh, they do have in terms of idea inside themselves uh okay Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Garba. Uh, another question is you are also, so this person wants to know as a writer, what inspires your writing? So do you write about being African in Spain or about Equatorial Guinea? Oh, uh, I think it depends of the moment of my life because if in this moment uh, that I have different motivations. When I was my first novel, Eras la Tierra, I try to keep um, some feelings about my family, my cultural background, in, in the way background, uh, things like this, because um, I think everybody, I think, yeah, uh, if when you are African or descendant, or uh, African descendant, then you feel like your, your, cultural background, your knowledge, your even your personal history is in is in danger. I mean, like you could disappear anytime. Like something like nobody knows everything about your history, your parents, your my grandma, my and then I try just to keep this knowledge in some way for the future. So I think that work is done for me right now. Is that, no, no, I, I could do more about that, but I think that part of my work as, as a writer is done. Now I'm trying to approach into all things completely different is the idea of this border that were created for us as a um, white people, black people, um, I don't know, in Latin America, this, this border, this, I don't know, these boxes, I could say even how to overcome these uh, definitions. I mean, I'm not just a, as a black person. I don't, I don't want to be just to be a white black person. I want to overcome this idea of to be black from the, this knowledge of me. So I would like to imagine how this border could be surpassed in some way. So science fiction is, um, is, a, diff is a different approach for this. So now I'm trying to approach to science fiction in order to, to, to write things like are, are not in this world right now, but maybe in the future. That's a very interesting idea, but can't we say that it's kind of a way also to escape reality escape reality mm -hmm. no i think as i said in the beginning i'm not an academic writer i don't feel as academic uh writer i i i i'm interested in um in, in the in, interest in uh in this kind of works but i'm kind of um, uncomfortable with this with this academic uh ideas because sometimes I think there are a lot of things like I know really I, how could I say I, I I prefer to be creative I think if we can find a solution is not in the academic 
uh, area, most of the solutions came from the, for me, came from the, in my point of view, kind of the, creative, the creativeness of the people. And then we should try to, in my point of view, we should try to approach to the creativeness in order to create new bonds, new, la new landscapes, and then even to find a way we can recognize each other. Because uh, creativeness for me is not just something like, a, my, in my imagination, creativeness is something like it's um, in contact with the kind of a spiritual work. Mm -hmm. So a spiritual work inside creativeness, um, I think is a very powerful thing. Like we, I, I try to work on it. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay. So uh, Yomaira has a comment for you in the question and answer section. Apparently the chat is not working, so you can read it. It's in Spanish and I don't read Spanish. Okay. It's, it's good. It's fine. She's, she's saying bye bye. Okay. So, one question What percentage of Fang people are Roman Catholics, and what role do the Fang people play in the legislative and bureaucratic aspect of Equatorial Guinea? What percentage of our people are Roman Catholics? I don't know really. Maybe 50%. Maybe. Um, and then what is the role of five people in the legislative and bureaucratic aspect of the cultural? I cannot respond to this question, but I presume, yeah, I, I, I don't know really, but I presume most of the things is of the legislative and bureaucratic aspect of the cultural are the same for a long time ago. So probably from the colonial state, but um, um, the two presidents in Guinea, uh, the first one was, Math was Mathias and the second one is uh, actual um, Teodoro Obiang. Both of them were our fun. And then the way the state, of, I could say like, for example, when Matthias stayed in the power in, in, in the government, he said to farm people to came from the where they the where they were inside a part of the of the rest of the country, to came to the littoral, to came to the Bioko Island, he like trying to encourage the people to leave the forest, to live in the cities. And then he encouraged the people. When he talks in the in the government, he say like language, national language, was a uh, fun language, um, and these things is are um, typical also from um, this other president, this Teodoro Bian. They they trying to um, to say that, um, fun is the main language. If you go to the government for, to do, uh, I don't know, you need a document or, or whatever. People is gonna talk to you in, in fun language. Um, then if you don't speak fun, the people look at you, you are not from Equatorial Guinea. So there is a way like this kind of majority, this is not natural because they are majority in the country. It becomes in a way also to put the kind of obligation to speak in, 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 in fun in public spaces. And then there are people that are not, they are trying to hide, they're trying to hide they are from a different ethnic group. So these kind of things happen in Equatorial Guinea. I don't know how this, all these things are, are, uh, are affecting um, the law in the way that it was produced or not. I cannot say that, but uh, I believe that it, that, it, that might happen because um, um, for example, like, like the, um, how do you call this? Um, when you get married, is that, that that was affected because of this? I think. 
just you could have, I think, more than one wife, or I think, yeah, I I suppose. And this is a typical thing of our farm people, they could have more than one wife. So if there are no more questions, I think, uh, thank you very much. We can we can end it here. Uh, we're very happy to have, have you and we hope you come back to MSU. Okay, thanks so much. Bye everybody. Thank you for coming and asking questions as well. Thanks to everyone and thanks for the opportunity to be here and then speak with um, uh, the people in here. So for me, it was, was a great, a great opportunity, a great experience. We're glad we had you. Thank you, everybody. See you next Thursday.